you better believe it. You better believe it. I'm, I'm using this, uh, this series title because I was in a conversation one day. You know, sometimes when you're in a conversation with people who know it all, uh, and sometimes you're talking to them, at the end of making their point, they said to me, you better believe it. And I was like, okay, right. <laughs> cool, I will. <laughs> all right, all right. And so, so I recently, and so what happened is I recently started thinking about the things that we should believe, the things that we should believe. What are those things that are indicative of what Christianity is and what Christianity believes? Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, many Christians don't know the core beliefs of their faith. That's the problem. Many Christians do not know the core beliefs of their faith. In Bible college the other night, I alluded to a scripture that comes out of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 5. The B clause, the B clause, the, or the second clause of that, which says, if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Okay, now check that out and think about what that just now said. If someone asks you about your hope as a believer, you are supposed to always be ready to explain it. In the King James Version, it puts it this way, that we should always have an answer for the reason why we believe like we believe. And on many occasions, if the truth be told, if someone came up to you, you can be seated, if tr someone came up to us and said, hey, why do you believe the way you believe, or why you believe, what, what, what's going on? We would have to come up with some. we would have to struggle, and all this other kind of stuff. And, and, and a lot of times, we, we need to understand that when, when you're talking to people, people are looking for information. And when they're looking for information, if you just tell them, well, because God's been good to me, that, that really doesn't help me if I'm trying to get into what you're in just because you're saying that God has been good to you. As a matter of fact, I can be a sinner and God has been good to me too. So if you're basing it upon only that God's been good to me and that's why I believe what I believe, then your belief is really not on a sure foundation. And so the scripture says that we ought to be always ready to explain it, that we should always have an answer. And the only way I believe to have a real answer is that you have to know what you believe first. You got to know what you believe. So, so we're going to take a few weeks, a few months, maybe about a year, and we're going to talk about, you know, what we, what we should believe, okay? That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what we should be believing. Because I keep finding this out. I keep finding out that every other religion knows what they believe. Yes, but Christianity lacks in this. It lacks in this. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were talking about something that their, 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 their daughter had, their son and daughter had gotten involved in, their son-in-law, whatever, okay. Uh, their kids had gotten involved in. And they was telling me, they said they've only been in it for a year. But they are able to articulate every doctrine that is important to that thing that they got in. And the thing that they got in was leading them astray. It was leading them away. And they were amazed that in one year time that these people were able to click off the beliefs that they were in, but yet in Christianity, you ask people about what they believe, they, they, they go, I don't know. I, I don't know why we believe this or why we believe that. And so I think that we need to attack this. I think that we need to know the word of God. So as I'm preaching over the next couple of months, I may not really wow you because you already told you it's the year reward and that couple of weeks ago, last week. So you ought to just keep that in mind while I'm preaching all this, okay? So you know why I'm thinking if you need God to do something for you, just lift up your hand and say, oh yeah, it is year reward because he sure is boring me with the rest of that stuff, okay? Okay? And so this today's subject I'm going to be talking about is the authority of the word of God. The authority of the word of God. I, I, I'm starting here. I'm starting here because everything we believe is based on the word of God. Everything we believe is based on the word of God. And if it's not based on the word of God, then it's useless. It's not worth anything. It's not going to cause anything to happen if it's not the word of God. And that, I believe, is the problem with a lot of what we believe in the church. We believe more stuff that's not based on the word of God than we do the stuff that is based on the word of God. People are able to come in our churches and wow us with their ability to articulate big words and say great things. And we hear all that and we go, wow, that's great. I'm going to live that. I'm going to do that. And it's not even based upon the word of God. We need to understand that everything that we should believe ought to be based upon the word of God. So we have to know why we believe the word of God. What is the authority behind the scriptures? If you don't believe the word, if you don't believe the Bible, then what is the foundation of your religion and how are you going to be able to stand when the devil comes against you? 
Think about that just for a moment. If I don't believe this book, if I don't believe this word, if I don't believe what's said in here, then what is the foundation of my religion? What am I standing on? Let me tell you something that I believe, and this just me. You don't have to believe what I believe. I believe that the scriptures are the foundation for our Christianity. And that when we stand upon the word of God, when the winds blow, when the storms come, and things come to try to take us out, this word will hold us steady. I believe that. I believe that with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, and strength. And that's why you don't see me, I hope you don't see me, uh, up one day and down the next. And, and, and this, feeling one way this day and feeling another way that, another. no, no, no. My entire week is based upon the word of God. My entire life is based upon the word of God. And therefore, I don't have all this, as I talked about on yesterday, this ebb and flow. We're up and then we're down. We're up and then we're down. No, I believe every everything that goes on in this book and regardless of how I feel regardless of what's going on my life stays steady and you know what I know about you the reason why your life is not steady is because you don't believe in the book so the foundation of our religion, the foundation of our, our Christianity has to be the book. The church has built its teachings and its faith on the reliability of the scriptures our faith is founded on the scriptures. What we teach, how we live, what we say, what we do grows out of the book. Everything we do comes out the book, y'all. We are people of the book. This is what we live by. This is what we stand on. We are people of the book. Y'all not going to like my preaching. I got my amens with me. Don't worry about it. We are people of the book. When we get out of the book, then we get out of God's safety. When we get out of the book, then we get out of God's will. When we get out of the book, then we get out of the way that God wants us to live our lives. We are people of the book. When you live the book, success comes. When you live the book, prosperity comes. I didn't say read the book. I said when you live the book. You see, there's a difference between reading the book and living the book. We've got a lot of people in the church that is reading the book, but they're not living the book. Therefore, James, the writer, had to say to the church, he said, listen, I don't want you just to be hearers of the word, but I want you to be doers of the word. So our faith, what we teach, how we live, what we say, what we do grows out of the book. We are people of the book. Come on, say we are people of the book. So let's look at what Paul says to Timothy. Let's look at what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15, 16, and 17. This will be out the New Living Translation. Thank you, Jesus. Paul says something to Timothy that I think is very pertinent to what we are discussing here today. 2 Timothy 3, 15, 16, 17. And that uh, when you are prepared to read that, read that for me. You have a mic? Did they give you? Okay. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. Uh -huh. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Yes. All Scripture is inspired by God mm -hmm. and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Everybody say amen. amen. So the first thing that Timothy is, 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 is said to, that the first thing that Paul says to Timothy is that, Timothy, you've been taught the Holy Scriptures. From the, what is your problem? What, 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 what is your problem? You've been taught the Scriptures from your childhood. Why, why is it that we are now starting to be fascinated by other things and other teachings and uh, uh, other, other writings and all this other kind of stuff? You've been taught the scriptures from your shame on you, shame on you, that now you are becoming influenced by other things and other teachings that are drawing you further from God rather than closer to God. Y'all don't like my teaching. That's okay. Because the, the, it, it, it's a shame on the church that that, that we have made the writings of men more important than the writing of God. We, we made book knowledge and we made our education and we made philosophy and we've made our way of thinking more important than the word of God. Shame on us. 
Shame on us. I mean, really, shame on us. So he, he says to Timothy, he said, listen, Timothy, you've been taught the scriptures from, from, from the childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting Christ. So the Apostle Paul, here he is, he's in, he's in a Roman prison, he, he's, he's of age, he's, he knows that his life is short, so he wants to remind Timothy, hey dude, you need to, you need to make sure that you stay in tune to the scriptures. Okay, I, I, I was in a class yesterday. I was in a class yesterday, and I heard I heard the the, the, the presenter talk about uh, in the aspect of, of of his ministry of singing that making sure that in song there is scripture. Why? Because the church can get so fascinated with stuff that sound good, and whatever sounds good, we will repeat it. And so if we sing something that is not scripture, then you will go out of this building singing it. So therefore, we got to make sure that what we sing is based upon the word of God. Because the word of God is the only thing that's going to last. Jesus said, Jesus, Jesus, not Ernie. Jesus said that heaven and earth was going to pass away, but my word will stand forever. Are y'all hearing me at all here? My word will stand forever. And therefore, we must settle everything by the word of God. And so Timothy is told here, dude, it is the scriptures that gave you the wisdom to receive salvation from Christ. The reason why I'm saved is because I heard the word. You missed an opportunity. You, you just, you just. The reason why I'm saved, the reason why you are saved is because you heard the word. It is the word of God that gives us the wisdom to, in order for us to receive salvation. So that's the first thing that he tells him. Then he, because the word, the word is the gospel of God. It is the good news of God. It is the good news of God. It is the good news concerning the son of God. It concerns his incarnation. It concerns his suffering. It concerns him, him being resurrected. It concerns him being glorified through the spirit it is the word of God that reveals to us the Christ of God it is the word of God that shows us the way that we can be saved in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God it is the word let me tell you something I cannot understand a church that says that it belongs to God that does not get excited about the word of God because the word of God is the Jesus that you say that you serve because he was with God and he is God can, can I rightfully divide this thing in here today? And so therefore, we need to understand the authority of the word of God. The next truth, the next truth, let me hear it. The next truth is that, that Paul says to Timothy is that all scripture is inspired by God. It is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Hmm. Hmm. The scriptures correct us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. This is very important. The scriptures, the scriptures correct us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. I can tell people who don't read the Bible. I can tell them. I can tell people who don't understand the authority of the word of God. You know why? Because they waiting for somebody to put them in check. I don't need to wait for nobody to put me in check. Boy, when I start reading that Bible, that Bible tells me how to line up and how to live and what I ought to be doing, how I ought to be acting, how I ought to be, huh? And then can I tell you something? I don't mean to belittle you. I don't mean to talk negatively about you. But can I tell you something? You do not have more authority in my life than the word of God does. That's why I don't have to wait on you to tell me something. If the book has already told it to me, if the book tells me to live holy, I don't need no preaching to tell me to live holy I got to live what the book says because the book is in authority in my life nobody's saying nothing to me that's it, it, it corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right God prepares uses the book to prepare and equip his people to do every good work so it says here that all scripture is inspired by God everybody say inspired by God all the book all of this book is inspired by God. 
Now, to say that it's inspired by God, it means that scripture comes to us from the mind of God, yet he uses the ministry of men. Huh? Everything in this book is the mind of God. And yes, he used the ministry of men. So, so sometimes people will tell you, well, that book was written by men. Yes, absolutely. I will not dispute with you. This book was written by the hand of man. But it was not written by the mind of man. This book was written by the mind of God. It was God who brought forth all of these ideas and concepts and commands. It was God who breathed the very words out of his mind mouth in order for man to put it on the pages I can't get nobody to talk to me in here so therefore this book is inspired by God the Holy Spirit moved on men to speak the words from God to write the word of God oh I need to break this stuff down because you need to know what you believe you need to know that you believe in a Bible that has been inspired by God when people tell you no that thing ain't right it's old it's antiquated it does not work for today you've got to know what you believe you got to believe that that Bible is inspired by God it is the mind of God for 10 years ago it's the mind of God for today and it's going to be the mind of God for 10 years for now why because the word of God does not change based upon the society nor the culture the word of God is the same because it's Jesus Jesus says I'm the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and therefore, so is the word of God. Tell somebody, say, we need to get this. Tell somebody, we need to get this. We need to get this. So all scripture is inspired by God. I thought about it. I thought about it in the sense that, it, you know, do, do we really understand the inspiration of God? The inspiration of God. You know, I've heard people say, you know, especially people that are artistic, you go to them and you ask them, you know, maybe they painted a picture or, or maybe they wrote a song or whatever. You ask them, what was your inspiration? And they will tell you, well, this happened or that happened and all this other kind of stuff. Well, God was the inspiration behind the writing of the word of God. The, doc the doctrine of inspiration, the truth that the scripture is indeed God's word to mankind is critically important. If you do not believe that the Bible is inspired by God, then you will pick and choose. Let's talk about that. You will pick and choose what you want to believe and what you don't want to believe. And therefore, that's why we've got so much mess going on right now. It's because we have allowed people to pick and choose what they should believe and what they don't have to believe. The entire book is inspired by God. We believe, that, and let me explain this to you, it's called the plenary inspiration. Insp uh, inspiration. What that plenary means is that it is totally inspired by God. Old Testament, New Testament, the poems, the Psalms, everything in the book. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, the book of Revelation, the entire book is inspired by God. Boy, this is the best preaching I've done all day right here. And so it is critically important. And because it's so critically important, it's not surprising that it is one of the first points of attack by Satan. One of the first points of attack by Satan is to try to get you to believe that the book is not inspired by God or that God is not saying something through it or that God is not speaking through it or maybe the thing has changed from the time that God has said it. It is always about this most, a uh, 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 first attack is always against the word of God. Let me, come on now. He, he begins by throwing doubt. He wants to throw doubt on the divine word. He questions the veracity of the word of God he suggests to us that God did not mean what he said uh -huh. he causes us to question did God mean what he said well I wish I had time I wish I had time but 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 every effort 
even today is being made to deny the divine inspiration of the scriptures. Every attempt is put forward to set aside the absolute authority. Every attack on the Bible, which we now witness uh, in the name of scholarship, is only a repetition of what the devil has been doing from the beginning. If you had the time, if you had the time, I would suggest that you go to Genesis chapter 3. When you get to Genesis chapter 3, you will find out that the same trick that the devil worked on Eve, it's the same trick that the devil is trying to work on us. When you get to Genesis chapter 3, I don't have time to go there, but when you get to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1, Satan approaches Eve and says to Eve, did the Lord say? That's what he says, sir. Did the Lord say that if you eat of the tree, that you go? Did the Lord say, are you sure that was the Lord who? Are you sure that that's the authority that you need to live by? Are you sure that that's the, is, is that the thing that you need to be controlled by? Are you sure that that's the thing that you need to live by? It, it, did the Lord really say that? The devil was trying to discredit the word of God. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Yeah, that's what God said. Yeah, that's what God said. See, if you don't believe in the inspiration of God, you can begin to question what God said. But you know what? There are times, I have to confess this, and you're going to have to confess the same things I confess during this year. There are times that I want to do stuff my way. But then the book tells me to do it another way. And I'll be like, did God really say do it like that? Yeah, that's the way he said do it. He said love. Yes, that's what he said. He said turn the other cheek. That's what he said. He did say all that stuff. It's right here in the book. Uh-huh. He said give place to wrath. He said hold your peace. I'll fight your battles. Yeah, he said all of it. And it's divinely inspired by God. And because that's what he says, that's what I got to live by. I can't allow the devil to trick me. I've been tricked by the devil before. I've been tricked by the devil. I know this has not happened to you, but I've been tricked by the devil to do the stuff that I wanted to do and not the stuff that this book told me to do. And when I did the stuff that I wanted to do and not the stuff that the book told me to do, I found myself in trouble. I found myself having to explain why it was I did what I did when I should have been doing something else. We have to believe in the authority of the word of God. Let me say a couple more things. I'm going to be done. I am just about done. This is just the introduction. Some people question the, 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 the uh, inspiration of the scriptures. Well, well, let me say this. A couple of things. I, I like statistics. I like to look at stuff. I like to look at history of things, stuff like that. Here's a couple of things I saw when I was studying. It says, it has been estimated that there are 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. And about 2,000 of them have been fulfilled to the letter already. Already fulfilled. 2,000 of them have been fulfilled to the letter. Although there are 66 books in the Bible written by 40 different authors, over 1500 years over 1500 years they wrote it in three different languages these device these diverse scriptures are internally consistent leading to support that there is only one author think about that just for a second you've got you've got 66 books you got 40 authors that the book was written over 1500 years but when you look at it internally and you see the same story one after the other 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 you will see that even though you got all these different authors you really only got one author and that's God we, we see the unity of the message despite the diversity of the human authors the book has really been in existence because you got to remember, we have an Old Testament as well. So the book has really been in existence for over 3,000 years. And by the way, it's been in existence over 3,000 years. It's been criticized. Don't think that you coming up with something new to criticize the book. That you the only one thought of something. Oh, look at that right there. No, baby. This book has been attacked year after year for 3,000 years, but not one, uh, uh, one irreconcilable difference can be found in the book. You can't find any discrepancies in the book. Every time you try to find something, it keeps on lining up. You know why? Because it's God's word and it's not man's word. If you, if, if man would have wrote it, he would have forgot he said something back over there. Come on now. He would have forgot, oh I, oh, oh, I forgot I said that. Now I don't say something different. No, baby, this book is consistent. 
okay? This book is consistent. So, so in, in my closing, so what am I trying to get you to see? What am I trying to get you to hear? What am, what am I trying to get into you? I want you to know that God's word must be received, believed, and obeyed as the final authority in all things pertaining to life and godliness. Okay? God's word has got to be received. It's got to be believed. It's got to be obeyed. It's the final authority. It is authority in the word of God. It must be used by the church. Let me tell you something. I can't use nothing else. All of my preaching, I, preach, I, I teach a sermon preparation class, and I tell my class that the only authority that you have as a man or woman of God preaching the word of God is the Bible. The newspaper can't be your authority. The culture can't be your authority. What people say can't be your authority. Facebook can't be your authority. The only authority of which you stand and the only thing that I have to believe that comes out of your mouth is what comes out of this book. All that other lies that you, I mean, all the other stuff that you say, I don't have to believe none of that. But when you stand up here and come from me, because you know pre preachers get up and lie, don't you? I mean, they be telling testimonies and they say sensationalize the testimony and all that other kind of stuff. The Lord did this and, Lord, and I told the Lord, you ain't told the Lord nothing. Shut your mouth. Okay, but only thing that I have to believe is what this book says. Because this is the authority that I stand on. And you as a believer in the body of Christ, you got to know this, that when it comes out of the book, you can trust it because God said it. Okay? So we got to submit. We got to submit. And the only way to submit to Christ's lordship, you got to be submitted to the book. You will never be submitted to his lordship if you're not submitted to the book. If this book is not the authority, then you will never be submitted to his lordship because this talk tells us about the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's why most people, it amazes me. I'm so sick of this. So sick of this. People are living their lives. They say they're Christians, but they're living based upon their own thinking. I'm going to do what my gut tells me to do. You crazy. You crazy. Your, your gut tell you do one thing one day and another thing that day. You're going to end up in jail. And then they got this foolishness that's going around talking about I'm my own God. Everybody's a God. I'm my own God. No, you, you, you going to. By the way, if you God, would you please break me off a million somewhere? I mean, if you really, and if you God, why you ain't got nothing? How in the world are you God? The God that I serve, Bible tells me he got a cattle on a thousand hills. Bible talks about how he's got riches and glory. You, how in the world are you going, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dare try to be God. The authority of our lives has got to be this word of God. It's got to be this book. It's got to be this thing that we live upon because this thing is infallible and it's inerrant. All of this is true, y'all. It is true. We got to get back to the book. We got to be people of the book. We got to get back to the authority of the book. Can I tell you something? When you get back to the authority of the book, the Bible says this. The Bible says, blessed is he that reads and does what's in this book. Now, if I'm going to be blessed by reading and doing what's in the book, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to read and I'm going to do what's in the book. Because I found out that if this is the way to get blessed, then I don't need all that other stuff. I don't need all that. Just let me do what's in the book. And my life will be blessed. So the word of God is useful. It's what we need. It's what we ought to desire. And so I, I said all that because as we go forward in this, I'm going to be talking about the doctrine of God. I'm going to be talking about the doctrine of Jesus. I'm going to be talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be talking about sanctification. I'm going to talk, but if we don't believe the book, then I can't, you ain't going to believe nothing I say. You got to settle this. You got you to get to this place where you know that the word of God is the word of God. The word of God is the word of God. And that's the book that we live by, the authority. That's the authority that we live by. So Paul says to Timothy, he says, listen, Timothy, you've been knowing these scriptures. It's giving you salvation. This book is useful to you. As I close, somebody play me some music. I will close. It said, it is inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what we ought to be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Would you look at somebody and tell them, get back to your Bible? Just tell them, get back to your Bible. Get back to your Bible. Get back to your Bible. Yeah, you got, you got CDs everywhere listening to everybody singing. That's good. But get back to your Bible. Get back to your Bible. Yeah, you listen to everybody preach. Yeah, 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 that's wonderful. But get back to your Bible. Get back to your Bible. We are people of the book. We got to get back to the word of God. 
I looked at my life and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always evaluating me. I just, I have to. And I begin to say, okay, how much time are you giving to reading your Bible? I mean, reading your Bible not to prepare to preach, but I mean reading your Bible. That's what I'm talking about, reading the Bible. And I begin to say, hey, I need to get back to my Bible. I need to get back. I need to get back to just the stories. Just read them again. Here, I want to challenge you. Here, I want to challenge you. Here's my challenge for you. Pick a chapter. Excuse me. Excuse me. That wasn't my argument. Pick a book of the Bible. Pick a book of the Bible. Please don't pick the Psalms. But pick a book of the Bible. That has at least... 16 chapters in it. I say 16 chapters because I love the book of Romans. And every day for the next whatever days that that book has chapters, you read one chapter out of that book every day. Just read a chapter out of the book every day. And you're getting back to your word. You're getting back to the authority that's in your life. And just read it. Well, Pastor... I don't think I got time to do that. Okay, okay. Instead of opening the Facebook app, open the Bible app. Some of y'all just had to close your Facebook app, didn't you? Instead of opening the Facebook app, I'll guarantee you, you open that Bible app and just read that chapter. Because I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this. I'm, I, I'm, on, I'm on Facebook, so I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool. Sometimes I go and maybe I, I'm going to eat lunch or whatever, and sometimes I park my car and I pull out my phone and boom, go on Facebook. Let me see everybody doing. Guess what? You know what I can do now? Open the book. Read the book. One chapter. That's all. One chapter. Okay? I'm a, I'm a connoisseur of Romans. I love Romans. Romans has 16 chapters in it. People that have been through my Romans class, how many of y'all been through my Romans class? How many of y'all been? You, you know that one of the exercises that we do is that in one sitting, we read the entire book of Romans, 16 chapters. You know what you can read in 16, 16 chapters in? You can read it in 45 minutes. 16 chapters of the book can be read in 45 minutes. Are you telling me you don't have 45 minutes in between the games? Am I getting in trouble or what? You, you trying to tell me you don't have 45 minutes in between scandal and who wants to be a murderer? I mean, you trying to, because some of y'all don't watch games, I had to find your thing. The real housewives of wherever they from. You, come on. We got to get back to the book. All of our lives depend upon what that book says. Did you know that? Your life depends upon what that book says. One of the things that I love about the book is that book says this. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what got me in. That got me in the, into this thing. It qualified me to be a born again believer. As we all stand, as we all stand, I'm done. I told y'all it's year reward, so remember that when you get bored when I'm preaching, okay? Just oh. listen to me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The book is all about getting you to relationship with God. And the way that we get to relationship with God in the New Testament is through Jesus Christ. And so if there's anybody here today that's not born again, that's not saved, does not have relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I want to open up this altar to you so that you can come down here, right here. And th there will be someone that will meet you and that will pray with you and that will speak over your life so that you can become a born again Christian and a born again believer. Because that's what God wants. He wants what he wants more than anything is for you to be his servant and for you to know him and for you to serve him and for you to love him. It's all about relationship. That's what God wants more than anything else.
Now, here's my next altar call. How many of you all, don't put your hand up if you get ready to lie in church. Please don't lie in church. The Bible says, this is the Bible, liars won't tarry in his sight. You got to shake your hand like that when you say that type of stuff. But I, but I, need, to, I need you to commit to the challenge. Okay? Over the next whatever days. Everybody sit down. Everybody sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Everybody open your Bible and find the book that you get ready to read. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Find the book you get ready to read. Find it. Find the book you get ready to read. Find it. Maybe you need to pray. Lord, show me the book I need to read. There you go. Find the book you're going to read. Find the book you're going to read. Mm-hmm. Find the book you're going to read. This is the best altar call I had all day right here. This is this is altar call. Don't, don't, don't misinterpret what's happening. You are at the altar. You're finding the book that you're going to read. Okay? Everybody got the book you're going to read? I'm sorry. At least 16 chapters, yes. I need you at least go more than two weeks. That's why I chose 16 chapters. And I chose 16 because I like the book of Romans. Everybody find something. If you can't find nothing yet, look over at somebody and say, you got any ideas? You know, ask. Yeah, there you go. Ask. We help us one to another. Yeah, we going. Boy, can I tell you what's getting ready to happen in this church? This church get ready to spill the word of God throughout this community. Uh-huh. Do you know what happens when the word shows up? Do y'all know? You don't know what happens when the word shows up? Things change when the word shows up. Old Testament has a scripture that says this. I sent my word and healed them. When the word shows up, healing shows up. Good God Almighty. Okay, everybody that's got what you're going to read, say, I got it, preacher. Come on, say, I got it. I got it. Okay, so, so, everybody that's got what you're going to read, stand up. Stand up if you got it. So, Father, we commit that over these next 16 plus days, your word is going to be a part of our lives. We're going to read the book. We're going to get into your book. It's the authority of our lives. And, Father, we celebrate the fact that we know that when we're in the book, we're with you. When we experience the book, we experience you because it's you. And so, God, I thank you that distractions, that time will not hinder us from what we need to do. We're going to be people of the book. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Jesus said, the words that I speak, their spirit and their life. You know what's getting ready to happen to you? I hear God speaking. God, I'm not in there is new life that's getting ready to birth out of you because of what you get ready to do. Everybody praise him for that new life that's coming to you right now.